Happy to have you back. This lesson is all about the power of conversations. We'll take a look at some of the rich conversations that can grow out of the simple question when it comes to exercising consistently, what's your single biggest challenge? Let's begin. Okay, so <clears throat> obviously you want to know <laughs> how to stop doing this. Obviously what we're looking for is this 180, right? Now, one thing, and it's perfect that you guys asked that. I want to know how because the, the conversation I want to have with you now is about conversations. So what often happens is we go when, when we're trying to make transformation, we go back to our weird habits, okay? Um, and I don't mean weird like you're weird, I just mean like the weird things we do, right? And so this doesn't work, but we keep doing it, right? So I have a message, I need the answer, I need the relief, right? And what is really trying to uh, be initiated is a conversation, okay? And so what I'm really um, advocating for, what I'm trying to get your attention about, is that I am not going to be telling you how to do this. We are just, <laughs> be, <laughs> shoot, huh? <laughs> Refund now. Um, And I guess th we're going to get to why in a moment, but what just came to me is think about, I, I brought up that quadrant, right? Think of all the different thoughts and ideas and personal um, insights that you got. So if I would have just told you, this is the quadrant and this is what you need to do, that would have been me telling you. The reason you want me to tell you what to do is because we're used to being here. You want someone else to tell you what to do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to do it, guys. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. But that doesn't mean that, that actually, that means that you are taking a step towards here. It's scary because you're used to here, right? But all we're going to do is we're just going to have conversations about this, OK? And you're going to come up with, baby step by baby step, your own solution, OK? So this will put your mind at ease a little bit. Our life evolves through conversations. The con or excuse me, let me say that again. Our life evolves through the conversations we are willing to have with each other. Through conversations, you have an opportunity to explore, to articulate, to test, and to clarify your thinking. Talking about happiness leads, helps you think about happiness. And the clearer you are about what true happiness is and is not, the happier you will be. And of course, we could replace that with health. So that is what we're doing here. We're getting clear about what health and happiness is and what it is not. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but you're going to know what to do moving forward. Does that make sense? I also love this. A person's success in life can usually be, me usually be measured by the number of uncomfortable conversations he or she is willing to have. Conversations. So this is not a comfortable conversation. It's not comfortable to identify dysfunction. But, and, until we label it for what it is, we can't get here. We can't keep labeling this as healthy and happy and get here. And then I love this one. One's mind, once stretched to a new idea, never regains its original dimensions. We're stretching. Okay. So... We're going to start this conversation. I'm going to keep flipping back and forth here. We're going to go here, and we're going to start a conversation. And we are going to use exercise. And we already kind of started that today when you guys were getting to know each other. Um, 
we're going to journal about the question when it comes to exercising consistently, what's your single biggest challenge? So just take, I'll give you two or three minutes. Jot down anything that comes to you. It doesn't have to be articulate. Just make it real. This is a conversation between you and you. Anybody willing or willing to share? <laughs> okay, so I was thinking about um, the challenge I shared earlier about just that, like I schedule all my workouts, but then sometimes I just can't do them, or I just I wake up and I just cannot do the workout that I had planned, and then I'm like, okay, so I usually schedule my workouts just for the week, and then I was like, and I give myself some flexibility, like you can do strength on Wednesday and Friday or Saturday, like <laughs> ooh Emily, <laughs> <laughs> and, then, um, and and then I'm just like, and this is my. But I'm always showing up because it's what I'm supposed to do. So my like mm -hmm. my week is always set on three strengths, two to three cardios, and one yoga. And I'm like, that's seven. Wow. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. That's seven workouts. Like so then it's like, well, no wonder some days you get up and you just cannot go. Like you're not supposed to work out every single day. <laughs> always. <laughs> so then it's like I get to that point and then it's just a cycle of like mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm like doing it. I'm saying like, forget it. I can't go today. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know what intimidated looks like, but then mm -hmm. I just flip really quickly back into the exhausted because then I like mm -hmm. the next day. This happened today. <laughs> <laughs> today I made it to the gym and cycled for thirty minutes. <laughs> mm hmm. I mean, I have cut back to thirty minutes from forty-five a few years ago. Mm hmm. Forty-five to sixty, but it's still like I didn't solve anything. Hmm. Because the essence behind it is the same. So you were saying that you wa you were wanting to give yourself more flexibility, but basically, it's like that didn't really solve the problem. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're right. It's like going, okay. oh, you can do cardio or yoga today. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, I thought flexibility was a solution, but it was temporary relief. Uh, okay. Okay. That makes I'm sense. I'm getting it. You're getting it. <laughs> You having a conversation with you? Yeah, I love it. cool. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else want to share about their well, challenges? I uh, can't ever decide which which workout is the right one to do. Ah, <laughs> yeah. So I spend a lot of time thinking about what I should do <laughs> <laughs> and not doing it. Um, and then maybe when I do try to do a workout at home, I am uh, feel like I'm always distracted by other things, around, other things around me that I should be doing, whether it's like physically being interrupted or mm -hmm. just mentally. Uh, it, I guess structured exercise, it's like it never makes it to the top of my priority list. Mm -hmm. And then I feel like, well, I should be active enough being a mom and farmer that I shouldn't have to exercise. And then like then taking the time to do something like I feel guilty about doing it yes because yeah. there's so many other things it's because the to-do list never does end. you know just like you have to cook food every day and you have to do laundry every day like so it's like well I'll have to do it tomorrow <laughs> I don't know I don't mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. it's always put off you're not alone thanks for sharing so I wrote a whole paragraph, and it was all exhausted, depleted thoughts. Mm. I'm not even going to repeat them, but they just went on and on and on, because I feel like I just needed to say them and get them out. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I went, OK, what am I really thinking? And then I went to a lot of days, I still think my body is 25 years ago, <laughs> where I used to be able to get up in the morning and just go run three miles and then bike for 10 miles yep. and do the pre-corp, right? Yep. Um, which is not where my body is at right now. Could be, but I don't even know that I want to be there. But some days I feel like I'm stuck in the past, and then I end up going to, oh, I'm going to do something maybe temporarily, and then I end up in pain. Mm -hmm. And then I end up kind of, that's where I go hide. 
and that's where comfortable things come into play. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then that conversation shifts to food, and what is that food? Mm. Is it a good choice? I don't know. That's kind of where I'm at. Well, You're also not alone. Anybody else want to share? Well, all of your, everything that you shared um, is certainly not the first time I've heard it or said it myself. Um, Laura, as you know, my, my team and I, we did a survey a um, little over a year ago now. And it was super illuminating. So we asked that same question. Um, when it comes to exercising consistently, what's your single biggest challenge? And we received literally hundreds and hundreds of responses. People were very, um, I, w I wouldn't say excited to answer it, but willing. <laughs> and, and I think now it's very telling because I think our whole culture is trying to figure out what to do about this health and exercise thing, right? Um, and so we're just grasping at straws. Can somebody help me, <laughs> right? And so I think that's why so many people were willing to fill this out. So I'm going to give you a taste of what the, of the responses that we received. I'm not going to give you hundreds, but I might give you 10 or 15 here so you can start to feel kind of the gist of it. This is kind of a good summary of what we received. After working and helping kids with homework and then getting dinner ready, it's really hard to get the energy to work out. I just lack motivation. Being embarrassed about the shape I'm in and being judged for it by people who have, who have not had my life experiences to understand how I got this way to begin with. And trusting someone enough to know that they genu genuinely want to help you begin the process of transformation. Lately it's energy because I have a baby and a seven year old. The other, other struggle is motivation, probably because I'm tired and having confidence in a routine. Knowing, knowing I'm getting the most effective workout in the precious time I sacrifice. I feel like I need to have everything in order, house, kids, etc., before I can focus on exercise. I also am overwhelmed by all those things that need to be done, and for some reason, I choose them before exercise. The best dependability for this used to be when, the fir when it was the first thing I did every day after rising with exercise. This is harder for me to do now that I'm older and stiffer and craving my coffee, etc. After teaching a full day, coming home to spend time with the two kids, five and two, getting food ready and getting everyone ready for bed, I have absolutely no energy left. I get frustrated with not making progress, and so I don't go for a couple days. Yes, I know that doesn't help. It's funny, it's like she's actually trying to, she thinks I'm judging her. <laughs> <laughs> then when I go, when I can Excuse me. Then when I go, I can get intimidated by people there who seem to have it all together and know exactly what to do and look great. And I love this gym intimidation. Hashtag gym intimidation. My body is bigger than ever, and I'm intimidated by it, by it to exercise. In addition, I have body quirks that are sometimes scary, and I worry that exercise will make them worse. Finding time to work out. Either I'm home with my kids or working. Then when, then when we are both home, I don't want to take from our family time. We don't get very much of it. Coordinating schedules of kids and my husband and myself and the guilt I feel for working all day away from my kids and coming home only to leave again for an hour. I'm too exhausted once they go to bed. Basically, I'm just full of excuses. Most routines are too difficult for an older person, beginner, or someone out of shape. Being told to just do what you can while watching a challenging routine is not fun, and you just stop doing it. I have four busy kids and a husband that leaves for work early in the morning. I used to be able to work out in the morning, but the new little ones are early risers, so I usually cut, get cut short. Then by the time everyone is in bed, I am ready to be done. Done, she says. Time and motivation. I work full time and have to get my daughters to their activities. I tell myself I will wake up at 5 a.m. to get a workout in, but every morning I would rather sleep. By 8 p.m. when I'm done with all I have to do, I'm too exhausted to work out. I have young kids and it's hard to keep them occupied while I'm trying to work out at home. I, I do like working out in the morning, but I'm too tired to wake up before they, they do to get it in. 
So it becomes a juggling act to meet their needs and work out at the same time. Just a couple more here. I think you're getting the gist, though. Time. I'm a teacher, so I have to be at, to work at 7.15. This means I leave my house by 6.45. I would have to get there by 4.30 to work out before school. I have two children of my own who play sports. Most nights, we don't get home till 8 or later. What's a girl to do? I have three kids, ages, ages three, at three, 21 months and two and a half months. My day starts at 5.30 a.m. with feeding, dishes, laundry, then getting everyone out the door by 7.30 for daycare. Work eight to five, then make supper, give baths, clean up for supper, so more dishes and laundry, and then everyone gets to bed by nine and I'm exhausted. When I finally get into the habit of working out regu regularly, it seems that something comes up to throw me off course. If this thing throws me off course, that, that working out becomes inconvenient for a week or more, then it feels, like the new, it feels like the new me that isn't working out it is the new habit. And as a result, my ego craves being lazy so much more than working out. I know, it's all my, my, I know it's all a mind game, but it can be so hard to convince my ego that I should be contributing to my body instead. For example, I did very well working out two to three days per week for a couple months, but then my life started started becoming a little more chaotic because we decided to sell our current home and buy a new one and now I'm out of the habit and it's so hard to drag myself back into it. I'm only laughing not at her just that can you see how I, ca I can't give you the answer like <laughs> I didn't know she's buying a house and that's what threw her off you know we you see all the details people are giving the ages of their kids the time they go to work Three more. I have a 13-month-old daughter. I always feel guilty when I'm not contributing all of my spare time to her. Yet I know me taking care of myself is the best example I can give her, and I do not want to be a hypocrite. And when I'm in the habit of taking care of myself, I don't feel as guilty. But asking people to pick her up from daycare so I can go to work out instead feels burdensome. For me, it's accountability and motivation. I'm not afraid to go to the gym or the yoga class, but it's about getting out of the house and into those places. I go to a strength class once a week and I see a personal trainer once a week, but that just doesn't seem to be enough to get me to do cardio or yoga on my own. I just don't feel like exercising. Maybe, maybe it's that I find it boring and don't want to get sweaty and need to clean, or I don't want to get sweaty and clean up a second time. For me, the biggest challenge I face is making myself get down on the mat. It's total, it's total psychological warfare. Once I'm there, I get started and I have no issues. Being retired, I don't have a lot of things I absolutely need to do. I usually can work around most commitments. So take a breath on all that. Could you resonate with most of them? Yeah. And can you see what is revealed from one question? The same essence. completely different details, right? Specific details. Once again, ages of kids, time they leave for work, type of work, husband's schedule, their schedule. So what I really want to point out now is, as I said before, conversations are transformational. Okay, Our life evolves through conversations. But if we would go back to that quote, he didn't just say our life evolves through conversations, period. He said, our life evolves through the conversations we're willing to have, OK? And so the problem is, with the conversations we're having with uh, our excuses, so to speak, we're often only going to the level of the V180, the vicious cycle. Another way to put it is we often don't go beyond discomfort Temporary relief, discomfort, temporary relief. And I'll show you how this is done. So we, here we have the after work, I'm helping my kids with homework and then getting dinner ready. It is really hard to have energy to work out. I just lack motivation. OK, so the conversation that she ended up having with herself was I just lack motivation. OK, so this was the conversation. This is where the conversation s stayed stuck. In the V180, the vicious uh, triangle. Look at what the conversation could have been about. It could have been about energy. 
And what is energy? Simply how we're allocating our time, money, or attention. So the excuse is trying to pull out of her a conversation about energy that there isn't a lot of it, <laughs> that she's feeling really depleted. And unfortunately, not her fault. This is what 99.999% of the people in our, our culture do. Because we value this quadrant, we then start to have a conversation with ourselves about the triangle. Here, she starts to have a conversation about convenience. Remember, that's how we market a lot of our stuff. But look at what she could have had a conversation about. She craves being lazy. That's like a perfect way to describe this, right? So life is wanting to have a conversation about a craving. She's, she's depleted, so she's craving this. But what she thinks is about is convenience. Here we've got motivation. Again, look at all the words. Energy, tired, sacrifice. Sacrifice is what we feel when we are here. So if she thinks that she is sacrificing time when she is exercising, that is the perfect description of feeling depleted. Because when you invest your energy, time, money, and attention, when you're on this side of the equation, it feels like a sacrifice. When you're on this side of the equation, specifically here, because you're actually investing it, because you're not here, this, this, oh, I got ahead of myself. This is an investment. This is a sacrifice. That's how it feels. This feels like an investment. You get an ROI on it. Not just later, but in the moment as well. OK, last one. OK, so here, again, the conversation is having is excuses. So she thinks her excuses are the problem. Because again, that's what we do in our culture. We, we mislabel it. Life is wanting to have a different conversation. Exhausted. Thoughts on that? On this one specifically? For all of them. Um, I think I'm um, seeing other people's excuses. I shouldn't say excuses, that's what they would label them. Was it hard to see or was it comforting? I think it was Both. hard to see. I feel so much pain. Every single one of them, I just wanted to cry. I know. But I've been in almost all of those situations at some point. I know. It's like they all deserve hugs, and, and then they come up with the idea that they actually just are, they have excuses or need motivation. Do you see the weird conversations we have with ourselves? Yeah. Like, you just need sleep. You don't need exercise <laughs> right now, lady. <laughs> so what I really want to um, bring your attention to is that I believe that life is always willing to have rich conversations with you. It's always wanting to have functional conversations, these 180s or inspired conversations. But it's never going to force us to. So we can stay stuck in the realm of this conversation as long as we want. We can keep telling ourselves this story over and over. But life will keep showing up to try to get our attention. And I love this quote. The truth knocks on, you, on the door and you say, go away. I'm looking for the truth. And so it goes away. And I feel like that's what happens. Here we have an excuse, OK, motivation, willpower. But then it, it, it'll keep coming back. But it goes away temporarily. But it's not until that we're willing to have a different conversation with ourselves, with life, with each other, that transformation actually happens. And another thing you probably realized is that a conversation about exercise is not really about exercise. <laughs> That's um, what I love about what Janine Roth says. She says, it's not about food, but it's not not about food. You know, It's the same thing about exercise. The reason you're not feeling inspired to exercise consistently is not about exercise. But it's not not about exercise. Like There's some components there. But when we either try to um, compartmentalize our life so strictly or 
not make it about the thing at all, we run into a lot of trouble, okay? And in regards to compartmentalizing, I just always think of the quote, no one is an island unto themselves. We don't know all the um, spider webs that got go out in regards to, you know, um, how everything is connected. And I feel that same way about life, okay? So when you talk about exercise, again, it's, it's about exercise, but it's not about exercise. The idea of compartmentalizing your life is a myth. It's a complete myth. Life is holistic. Everything affects everything. So no one, um, I was going to see if I could rephrase, no one is an island unto themselves. No aspect of life is an island unto, it, unto itself. So I'll end this lesson by just telling you my experience how I began to transform my relationship with my body and with exercise and health and life. Um, and so as I said before, I spent a ton of time, I used to spend a ton of time here with exercise and just with life. Food was uh, usually here until I felt, you know, like I should be doing something, usually didn't, and then I would um, exercise, okay? So that was my journey or that was my existence. And what really changed for me, when things really started to change for me was when I found that book, Intuitive Eating, that I mentioned earlier today. Um, that was really the first time I realized that I could engage with food without rules. I really only thought you either totally disengage or you have a ton of rules. And I had weird rules just weird-ass rules for myself. I'd be like, okay, this week you can have three treats, but then if something comes up, you can have an extra treat, and the extra treat can be like a birthday, or if somebody just like decides, you know, they want to go out at like nine o'clock, that could probably be an extra treat. I mean, it was just bizarre what I would tell myself, okay? And so what intuitive eating started to do for me was it started to help me see that I could be here, okay? and gave me some practical tools on how to actually engage with food in a way that felt free. Now, as I continued my journey, more and more things helped with that. As I went through health coach training, that helped, so on and so forth. But my point of this story is once this got thrown off, the whole triangle started to wobble in a good way. It started to throw off the vicious cycle. And what slowly started to happen was I started to bring exercise here too because I started to trust this. I started to know this. I started to value this. I started to become more sensitive to when I wasn't there because I was practicing this with a different aspect of my life. And now I didn't have my main forget it tool. It was over here. And so every time that we can throw off this vicious cycle, we are more apt to hang out here. Does that make sense? Now with uh, my story, one, well, I'll just say it this way. I would use exercise as permission to eat. That's a key, or it's an uh, indication, a strong indication that you're um, on this triangle. If you use something as permission to do something that's natural, that's something that's good. So I use exercise as permission to eat. That used to be the way I um, operated. And so exercise, although, once again, said a different way, although it looked good, although it looked healthy, it was clearly, I was clearly in a very um, interesting relationship with it if I thought I needed permission to eat. That's goofy. A lot of times um, it might look like this. In our culture, I use my 60-hour work week as permission to rest or play. Yeah. We're doing this. So take a deep breath on all that. I know it's not a comfortable conversation. Any thoughts before we move on? I'd be curious to know specifically, um, what are your thoughts on the idea of conversations? Like having it, 
having transformation be about conversations more than someone telling you what to do or a specific, specific tip or tool or program. Does it make you uncomfortable? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's logical but scary. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. That's yeah. a really good way to put it. No, logical like, but scary. You have to you have to be willing to be honest at least with yourself. Mhm. Mm Which is know. probably the hardest person to be honest with sometimes. <laughs> But I think it's a positive because I think it gives you somewhere to go. Like it, it gives you the opportunity to always grow mm -hmm. instead of saying like, well, you didn't achieve this, so you're bad. Or mm -hmm. you achieved this, so that's good enough. You're great. You're so much better than all these other people. So why should you have to do anything else? Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. It's, it's almost like because conversations are always evolving, mm -hmm. It's like growth mindset, mm -hmm. right? Conversations align with growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. Well, I think about challenging conversations. Um, like you were saying, they're logical but scary. But then when I think back on some of those conversations, how free I feel after mm -hmm. having those conversations mm -hmm. and why can't I remember that? Mm. <laughs> That's such a good point. I, I can't remember who said it, who coined the term, but they said something like seven minute sweaty conversations. Like, if we just were willing to have more seven minute sweaty conversations, just meaning like the ones that are just messy and ugh, and ugh. Yeah. But it's true. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of power there. I think it's hard having the conversations with yourself about yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I mean, I think it's very powerful, and, and, and in a way, it can give that power back to you because you can tell yourself what you're doing, also think here's what I can do. But yet, you know, you still have that monkey chatter in your brain of like, yeah, but you haven't done it before, you know, and what's you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so, like, so I, I think that's that's part of the part where it's like you have to remember it's a conversation. It's not like you you don't have to do it and it's done and check it off your list kind of thing. It's like it's gonna always change and you just have to keep talking to yourself and recreate those little pathways <laughs> your little slutty nose <laughs> right you just like have to keep out. talking to yourself i love that <laughs> I know. Yeah. well and you're in luck our next lesson is titled process and practice i feel like it, when we talk about what this society values it's like women are expected to look a certain way but you're not expected to like take time mm. away from your children, your spouse, your job, your volunteering, or whatever. That's a great point. To help look that way. It's supposed to magically happen. Effortless. Yeah, right. It's supposed to, right? It's supposed to look effortless. And, it, and it's frustrating because I don't have biological children of my own. But my mom has always had health issues, mm -hmm. and she's one of those people who does not have to exercise to be tiny. Mm -hmm. And she actually has the problem of not being able to put on weight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I used to tell her all the time that she, she'd be like, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this. And I'd say, well, you can't do any of that for us if you're dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of women don't get the opportunity to see, like, if I'm a mother, whether it be of girls or boys, and I don't get the chance to, like, take time to take care of myself, whether it be exercise or meditating or whatever, that sends a message that repeats the cycle because then it tells your kids that they're more important than your own health, that a mom is not supposed to take time away, a mom is supposed to spend all of her time helping us. Daddy can take time away often mm -hmm. to go do other things, but mm -hmm. not mommy. Yeah. And it's, it's frustrating because I was just getting pissed, <laughs> like, mm. <laughs> reading those of like, yeah, it's just as important for mom to take care of herself. And it's, it's just, as much of a 
like teaching your kids how to grow up properly to let them see you taking care of yourself and valuing yourself mm -hmm. as giving them healthy food. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think, I think you bring up, it's just great, frustrating. I, I like the way you said it, that we're expected to look a certain way, but not take time away from other things yeah. to get that <laughs> physique. So yeah. that's, I think that's just yeah. a perfect way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Effortless beauty. Now that you're done with lesson two, and you've listened to so many individual responses to the question, when it comes to exercising consistently, what's your single biggest challenge? I hope you no longer feel alone when it comes to your struggles around exercise. I hope you're also able to see that there's potential for rich conversation behind the unique excuses you notice yourself voicing in your everyday life. In the next lesson, we're gonna talk about how these rich conversations are ever evolving, how a life lived beautifully is more of an art than a science. See you over there, module two, lesson three.